Hey, what's up everybody? This is Pastor Terrence from Victory Church right here in Sumter. Listen, I'm so excited. I just finished a sermon series entitled The Marismos Teaching. Now, Marismos is a Greek word, and we find it in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder. That phrase right there, dividing asunder, is the Greek word marismos. And it means to separate, to cut, take apart, or divide. And what God has showed us through this word is that only the word of God is able to get in us and primarily separate soul from spirit. Listen, we've got to have our souls separated from our spirits because guess what? You may know this already, but your spirit man is saved. But our soul still has some work to be done. And so God, through this process, shows us who we are, and then we present that area unto God for him to deal with it. And the whole intent of this marriage folks, is for us to be spiritually mature, to have a spiritual breakout. For the Bible says that we are to become the sons of God. Sons are spiritually mature Christians. The Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. And that's what we want. So let me tell you, this teaching has been a blessing unto me, and I think it's blessed our people. And we are presenting it here to you every Thursday night right here at 7 p.m. So please like, comment, and share it with a friend to be a part of this dynamic teaching called the Mary's Most Teaching. God bless you. Hebrews 4, chapter 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful. Y'all shouting already. Like you ain't never heard this scripture before, but when you say the word of God, it just got to do something in your spirit. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing as under of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Only the word of God has that description. Hold your finger there and flip over to Luke chapter 9. We're going to look at verse 23, and it says, this is Jesus talking. And he said unto them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Say cross. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this glorious day day that we celebrate, commemorate, and observe your love, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this word that shall come forth. God, I thank you for the rhema that shall sit upon each of those who are under the sound of my voice. Speak to me and through me to your people. I hide myself behind the cross. So that when the people look up, they would see no man, not me, save Jesus and him crucified. Not just crucified, but buried, quickened, and raised again. It's all about you and your son, Jesus. So God, I thank you in advance for those who you're going to save on the day. Somebody's getting saved today. Somebody's getting healed today. Thank you. Somebody's getting set free and delivered today. Thank you. Thank you in advance. So we step out of the way to give you your office space to do your office work. It is in the matchless name of Jesus Christ that we say amen and amen again. Why don't you put your hands together and give God praise as you take your seats. Glory to God. Church, I give God praise for being here on yet another Easter Sunday. Give God praise for Senior Pastor and Elder Murrow, our founders and forerunners. <laughs> Hanging in there. Thank you so much. God bless you. We love you with the love of the Lord. Church, look at your neighbor and say, go back and get your cross. Come on, find somebody else who looks a little more friendly and say, go back and get your cross hallelujah listen now when you leave your house there are certain items if left i am more than certain that you will turn around do a u-turn and go back and get it 
Your wallet, say amen. amen. My God, your cell phone. Amen. AirPods, earbuds. Ladies, your purse. Amen. And nowadays, you got to make sure you go back and get your mask because wherever you end up going, it doesn't make any sense to get there and realize you can't get in without your mask. Go back and get your mask. But I submit unto you today, and I'm talking to Christians, if you leave home without this one thing, go back and get it. I'm talking about your cross. Come on, look at your neighbor one more time and say, go back and get your cross. Hallelujah. We are right here, church, on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, where we observe the most significant and consequential period in Christendom. The death burial, and more importantly, the resurrection of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. The prophet Isaiah talked about him this way. He says, he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. Come on, are you able to identify with Jesus? He said, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are what? We are healed, we are whole, we are saved, we are safe. So by the divine providence of God, here we are based on God's, I want to say, his flawless timing. I couldn't get that right. God's divine timing on Easter Sunday, here we are still in the Marismo series. Because I want to show you That so long ago, it was in this period, in this season, when God, through his son Jesus, taught us the Marismos. Say Marismos. Now listen, last year this time, I was in a series called The Doctrine of Christ. And I would normally pause from a series so I can do a sermon that's topical based on Mother's Day, Father's Day. You know what I mean, Christmas and Resurrection Sunday. But God had a time last year that during the doctrine of Christ, come Easter Sunday, we were talking about the resurrection of the dead. Put all of your eggs in one basket. And here we are this year in a series that I don't have to pause because God taught us The merest most during the Easter season. Let's give God a big shout of praise for that. I'll explain it later, but just know that God is some kind of special. So last week, we looked at how we are to deny ourselves by weaning our soul from self. You know, gradually getting your soul to do without what it wants if it is not the will or the way of God. That sounds a lot easier than it is. That's last week. Today, we're looking at what Jesus said next in that scripture. He said, take up your cross daily, and then you can follow me or be my follower. So, church, I believe that all that God wants for us and from us is captured in the merest most. And for those who have not heard our previous messages on this, we get the term merismos from our text in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, where we see the phrase, dividing as under. For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing as under. That phrase is the Greek word merismos. It means to take apart, to separate, or cut, because God lets us know that man is a tripartite being. We are spirit that possesses a soul and lives in a what? Body. So we are saved instantly in the spirit and progressively in the soul. That's where the junk is. And then eventually in the body. So the intent of the marriage most, I'm teaching much better than you know it. The intent of the marriage most is for us to be complete in him. There is no completion for you outside of him. If you think you're going to get married so you can be completed, don't marry that person. Don't come up to somebody and say, you know what, we need to get married because you complete me. He or she ought to tell you, how about you run, go get complete, come back, let's talk about it. So the purpose of the marriage most is for you to be complete in him with your spirit having oversight of a subdued soul. Your soul must be under control so that your body follows as it is constantly put under subjection. I'm trying to help somebody here. 
And we are never going to get to this point without, check these terms out, sacrifice, love, denying oneself, cross, crucifixion, and death. And I know you think we're talking about Jesus, but I'm talking about you. Oh, yeah, when we hear those terms, sacrifice, cross, crucifixion, love, forgiveness, agony, you think we're talking about Jesus, but I submit to you, I'm talking about you. Somebody put your hand on your chest. So, church, I'm telling you, the resurrection story, the whole Easter story is captured in the Marismos. And we talking, you say, well, uh, Pastor, you were supposed to talk about the cross last week. This week, we're supposed to shout because he's risen. You got your dates out of order. Why are you talking about the cross today? Didn't you see what everybody posted on Facebook? But let me tell you something. You don't have to worry about resurrection if you don't deal with this cross. Not Jesus's, but yours. And the cross is the principal or primary symbology for Christianity. But before we dig into what your cross is, let's look at what it's not. Are you ready for me to bring the book? There are two basic understandings of our cross. Number one, we view the cross as a cherished symbol of love and sacrifice and atonement and forgiveness. But that's the cross that Jesus bore and died on. But he said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. So please don't confuse your cross with Jesus' cross. Because I promise you, you can't bear the cross that Jesus bore. I ain't got enough help in here. You think you can take on that? The passion of the Christ? Don't confuse your cross with Jesus' cross. Secondly, Christians interpret the cross as some burden that they must carry, uh, a strained relationship, a wayward child, a physical illness, something that's going on wrong in your life. And you say things like, well, I guess that's just my cross to bear. I got a daughter that I haven't seen in 15 years. We don't talk. Things not going well. I guess that's my cross. Come on, church. Don't be no fool. Don't try to spiritualize unpleasantness and attach it to discipleship. Did you hear what I just said? Don't try to spiritualize unpleasantness and attach it to discipleship. Your cross is not sickness or pain. Your cross is not pain and agony. Your cross is not bad circumstances. That would mean being a Christian is an unpleasant experience. And I don't know what Bible you're reading, but my Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Jesus said, I came that you might have life, that Zoe life, and that you might have it more abundantly. I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospered. What you mean trying to spiritualize bad circumstances and say, I guess that must be my cross. So then, what is our cross, preacher? What is the cross that we must carry? I'm glad you asked. Jesus was using symbology here because he knew any reference. Listen, he knew who he was talking to. He understood when I say certain words, you know what I mean. So he was using the symbology because he knew any reference to the cross meant one thing and one thing only. Death by the most cruel and humiliating means because see the Romans would force their criminals to carry their own cross the same cross that you're going to be crucified upon so when Jesus said take up your cross he was telling them and us today listen if you're going to follow me you've got to do something with that flesh if you're going to follow me, you got to do something with that soul that's out of control. The Bible says, for in the flesh dwelleth no good thing. Jesus said, no flesh is going to glory in my presence. If you're going to come with me, you got to do something with that soul. You think I'm running a Burger King religion where you can have it your way. He was saying, you've got to crucify self. And here's the kicker. Nobody is going to put you up on that cross. That's why you can't confuse your cross with Jesus's. They put Jesus on the cross. You know the story. They put nails in his hand. 
They put nails in his feet, but you got to get up on your own cross. You got to present your own self a living and a willing sacrifice. Am I in the book? So church, here it is. Take up your cross. I need my note takers to write this down. Take up your cross means to maintain your own willingness to die to self. Take up your cross, it means maintain your own willingness to die to self. Listen, the cross is your personal execution device. So you can die to self and live a life of Christ. I know you want to talk about resurrection, but you can't get the resurrection until you do something with that cross. Jesus said, you trying to follow me? Okay, but you forgot something. You, you, you want to follow me? You want to go where I go? You want to do what I do? You forgot something. Not your big old Bible. Not the cross that you inherited from your great-grandmother that you wear around your neck. Not your long dress. Not your head covering. Not denomination. Not tradition. Not religion. But you need to go back and get your cross. You need to go back and get your personal execution device. The old saints used to say, you ought to take the Lord with you. Everywhere you go, in the streets, in the crowd, in your home, when you're all alone, you ought to take the Lord with you everywhere you go. Listen, I don't want to mess up your theology or have you thinking differently about grandmama, but if you save, the Bible says the spirit of the Lord dwell within you. God's going to go wherever you go, but you got to go back home and get your cross. That's on you. So guess what? You're on your way to the mall for some shopping. Go back and get your cross. You headed to work for the day and you know what kind of supervisor you got? Go back home and get your cross. You got called to school because something happened with your child. I promise you, don't go to that school until you do a U-turn in that road. Go back home and get your cross. I know you got a, 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 a reservation. You're already on the books to get your hair done and your nails done. But don't you go to that salon until you go home and get your cross. No, I'm good because I'm going to choir rehearsal. Oh, I promise you, you're going to need your cross when you go with the saints. You need it there too. No, no, preacher, it's Sunday morning. I got on my, you better not leave home. Without your cross. Look at your neighbor and say, don't leave home without it. Come on, one more time. Don't leave home without it. I'm not saying anything is wrong with you. I'm just saying just in case, because I know you're saved, but just in case your flesh decides to rise up. Who am I talking to in here? I mean, I'm, no, I, I'm only looking for saved people now because saved people understand that there's just a certain kind of thing that might trigger a certain kind of thing. We all are work in progress. Go back and get your cross just in case your flesh begins to rise. And if you're a good friend of, yourself, of somebody, say, girl, did you bring your cross? Do you know who's going to be there? Bruh. You know what happened the last time. Would you please go back in the house and get your cross? Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> friends don't let friends come out without their cross. And you should be shouting because you want me to have my cross. You know me, so you should say, I don't think you brought your cross today. And I'm happy that I have my cross because I know that I could have snatched somebody, but I had my cross. I could have said something, but I knew I have my cross. I could have got an attitude. I could have got all up in my feelings, but I went back home and got my cross. So church, before Jesus' arrest and trial, let's go back. He stopped off in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there, that is the place where he demonstrated and explained to us this business about a personal cross. 
Remember now, this is your personal execution device. We know that Jesus was totally submitted to the Father. We know that Jesus is God, but hear me, Jesus had a will of his own. Don't shock me down now. Jesus had a suke. See, you, you, you're looking at your friends and saying things funny. Oh, get out of here, suke. Jesus had a suke. He had a will of his own. So right there in Gethsemane, for the first time in scriptures, we find a clear distinction between, and merits most between, Jesus' will and the will of the Father. That's a merits most. How do you divide Jesus from the Father? The merits most. For the first time in scriptures, now we already know that Jesus had a run-in with Joseph. Because when he was left back at the temple, Joseph and Mary tried to chastise him. And Jesus had to subject his flesh. He's like, okay, so, you know, I got another daddy. But here we are in Gethsemane for the first time in scripture. We see a merit most between the will of Jesus and the will of the Father. The way of Jesus and the way of God. Jesus knew that he was going to physically die. And that reality brought into bear the number one problem of the soul, which is self-preservation. Don't miss this now because, listen, it is natural for us to preserve ourselves. If someone swings at you, there's a natural uh, inclination to lift your hand, to block it. It is natural for us to defend ourselves. It is natural for us to preserve ourselves, but it's not spiritual. I'm trying to teach here today. People even say things without fully knowing what it means. I just don't want to lose myself. Oh, I know what you mean because you can get lost in your marriage. Aren't I more than just a wife? Is that it? I don't want to lose myself. Am I just daddy? I hear it 50 times a day. Dad, 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 dad. Somebody please call me something else. Just call me by a nickname or something. I know what you mean. You don't want to lose yourself in your job. You don't want to lose yourself in your family. I understand what you mean, but trust me, you do want to lose yourself. Because self is the problem. Don't get married if you don't want to lose yourself. Gone. Oh, I ain't got no help in here. Even the married people scared to say something because they spouse in here. Don't get married if you don't want to lose yourself. See, if we really did things the way we're supposed to do it, you should stand down here with the couple and the preacher instead of saying, repeat after me and say, I do, the preacher should get them to say, I die. For her and to myself, my will. My way is not important anymore. Do you? Yes, sir. I die. You're going to die today. Y'all don't want to talk because y'all want to do it the traditional way. And then you say, I do, and then you stop doing it. You should have said, I die. Don't get married if you don't want to lose yourself. Don't have kids if you don't want to lose yourself. Don't enter into ministry running behind something you see on TV if you don't want to lose yourself. Don't go into church leadership if you don't want to lose yourself. I dare to remind you again that Fantasia said, sometimes you got to lose. What kind of Christians are y'all? But the truth is the truth. Fantasia says sometimes you have to lose to win again. If you don't want to use that example, Moses said that I refuse to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I don't want to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I choose rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God. Sometimes you got to lose to win again. Moses said I'm going to give up the palace to hang out with my people. Sometimes you got to lose to win again. Paul said to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Sometimes you got to lose to win again. Jesus said, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Sometimes you have to lose to win again. 
so Jesus knew that he was about to lose his self-life. His self-life had come, as boys to men says, to the end. I'm going to get some real Christians in this church eventually. All I do is win, 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 no matter. Sometimes you got to lose to win again. And we know that Jesus understood this because Jesus was about to lose his self-life. His self-life was coming to an end, but the will of the Father was about to birth and manifest many sons. Many sons. But we know it was a struggle because Jesus prayed three times asking if there was another way. God, is there another way? Somebody say the struggle is real. See, the church want to tell you, don't do this, don't do that. Don't do drugs, don't do alcohol, don't have sex. But are you going to talk to me about the struggle? We've all gotten used to our soul, to our self having his own way. But you can't have it your way and follow Jesus. Church, listen, this time of year, this is the week that you see many times Services, sermons on the last seven words of Jesus while he was on the cross. And I'm not trying to be, you know, uh, antithetical to tradition, but let me tell you something. Before those last seven words, he said these seven in the Garden of Gethsemane that sealed the deal. Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. I'm not saying the last seven words they said on the cross were not important. But before he got to the cross in the garden, he said seven more important words. Not my will, but thine be what? Done. Church, that's all God needed to hear. That's all he needed to hear from Jesus, and that's what he's waiting to hear from us. I know that Jesus said, tetelestai, which is Aramaic, Aramaic for it is finished. That's what he said on the cross. But God heard him say it's finished in the garden when he said, not my will but thine be done. At that moment, Jesus took up his cross. I know you don't hear no preaching like this before, but you're looking at me funny. So I need you to grab your Bibles and turn to Isaiah. And if you wasn't looking at me funny, I would have went on by it. But now you cost yourself five more minutes. Say five more minutes. You better say amen. amen. But when you look at me funny, I got to qualify what I'm saying, especially if it challenges what your grandmama told you. Isaiah. There's something I need you to see. Isaiah, are you there? Look at chapter 53, and I want you to notice what it says in verse 4. Somebody say, word up. Verse 4 says, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Y'all know this passage. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. I can hear the organ cranking up now, but don't do it in here. God made it fail. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. You know this scripture, and this is exactly where we normally stop and put a praise on it. But if you drop down to verse 10, you got to do so so you don't miss the revelation. There's nothing wrong with dancing and shouting, but don't miss the revelation. Verse 10 says, yet it pleased the Lord, that's God, to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Now remember Minister Sean, you're so beautiful. You're up here doing communion. Said Jesus said, no man take my life. That wasn't his body. And you know for God, you can't mess with his spirit. That was his soul. Listen to what it says now. Verse 11. He, say God. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. 
When God saw Jesus travailing in his soul, Jesus even said out of his own mouth, he said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. The Bible says, when God saw the travailing of his soul, he was satisfied, for he shall bear the people's iniquities. Stick with me here. Because in verse 12, we see that it says that he poured out his soul unto death. It says in verse 12, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Church, I'm not trying to mess up your theology nor the long-held Sunday school traditions of how you were taught, but I submit to you that Jesus had two crucifixions. Oh, I know it's done got quiet up in here because when you looked at the movie, you only saw one. (laughs) Jesus had two crucifixions, one in the Garden of Gethsemane. That was the crucifixion of his soul. The second was on the cross at Calvary. That was the crucifixion of his body. Jesus said, if any man come after me, he must deny himself, take up his own cross. Jesus is not saying that you have to physically die to follow him. I don't know how many times you're going to try to reenact carrying Jesus across. I don't even want to do that as a part of a play. Because I ain't trying to play with that cross thing. That was Jesus' cross. But Jesus had two crucifixions. He had a crucifixion in the Garden of Gethsemane, say his soul. And he had a crucifixion on the cross. Somebody say the body. That's the Maris most, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus himself, say himself. Jesus himself died on Calvary. But he died to himself in the garden. Y'all ain't ready for this graduate level. Jesus himself died on Calvary. But he died to himself in the garden of Gethsemane. Aren't you glad? Somebody put your Bible down and just begin to give God praise. There would be no Calvary if there was no Gethsemane. Do you hear what I'm saying? God does not want you on Calvary. He wants you in the garden. And he wants you to say, not my will, thine will be done. This is the Marismos that Jesus taught for us. His body died on the cross. But his soul was already laid to rest in the garden. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. So here we are on this Resurrection Sunday going back to understand that Jesus' soul became the offering for sin, not his body. And the Bible says when God saw the travail of his soul, he was satisfied. Say, penalty met. Come on, say, debt paid off. God said, this is the Lamb of God that's bearing the sin, the infirmity in his, when he laid down his soul. Jesus said in John 10, now I know the Father loved me because I've laid down my life. Somebody give God praise again. That's the real crucifixion. Let me tell you why. God looks at self-crucifixion. He didn't look at the crucifixion by others because the Bible says he wouldn't even look at Jesus on the cross. I know I'm messing up your theology, but get in that book. Jesus said, listen, no man take my life. I lay my life down. God says, I'm not looking for what other people do to you. I'm looking at what you do to you. (laughs) It's too much. It's too much. I told you, don't be distracted by the Easter bunny and the eggs and the hunt and the coloring. You're going to miss the revelation of Easter. Spend all that money on your clothes and your hair, and you don't understand what God is trying to teach us. Somebody say, teach us, Lord. Come on, one more time. Teach us, Lord. There's nothing wrong with the old rugged cross. But we've got to learn to love the cross that we take up. 
Let Jesus deal with his cross, but you've got to learn how to love your own cross. Philippians chapter 3 verse 18 says that there are some, listen, there are some who are enemies of the cross of Christ. He didn't say that there are people who are enemies of Christ. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. Why is that? Because the cross represents your personal execution device. People don't want to execute themselves. I told you this was elective surgery. It's still quiet in here. But that means the Holy Ghost is teaching. Somebody lift your hands up and say, teach us Holy Ghost. Come on, say it like you mean it. Teach us Holy Ghost. Because I know you sing louder than everybody else. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. He says, yeah, but do you love the cross? Because there are people who say they love Jesus, but they don't love the cross of Christ. They actually hate it because it represents self-destruction. So when you go back to get your cross, you live a crucified lifestyle. That's why, listen, that's why Paul said, I am, he didn't say I was, he said, I am crucified with Christ. It's a daily crucifixion. Who's ready to die? Come on, senior pastor used to say, I must, I must, who's ready to die? Die to self. Because you cannot please yourself and please God at the same time. So now you know when you head to the mall, go back and get your, you know when you got to go to work, you know who's there, go back and get your, I know you think this is a safe place, I'm going on a family vacation with all my cousins, go back and get your, I know we're talking on Resurrection Sunday, but the cross is hidden in the seven words. What is it? Not my will, thine be done. Church, let me get out of your way. It's Easter, and you might want to go and celebrate with your family. Go grab something to eat. But I want to put this revelation in your spirit. That these are the words that God wants to hear from us. Every day. You know you. So if you have to say it in the morning, then again on your way to work. Then again, right before you walk in the door. Then again, when you go get some water. Then again, when you take the first phone call. If you have to say it again, when work is over and you're heading home to the safe place. Because if you don't think you need your cross in your house. Your husband or your wife will require you to get your cross. The children that you love in birth will make you crucify yourself so you don't crucify them. I'm preaching sound doctrine in here on the day. I used to say salvation costs God everything. It costs Jesus his life. I used to say, but it costs us nothing. That's a nice little cute cliche, but I'm learning to look past what we've always said because the merits most teaching reveals that we are right. It did not cost us anything to get saved. All we did is confess the ABCs. It's just as easy as ABC. It costs us nothing to get saved. But the merits most says, but that was your spirit. It only took the ABCs for your spirit to get saved, but that soul needs the M-E-R-I-S-M-O-S. Because that's where the junk is. How many people got a saved spirit in here? How many people need the merits most to do something with that soul? (laughs) Well, you need the cross. God's word, his will, and his way. Denying yourself and taking up your cross. Hear me, I just want to talk. Denying yourself 
Taking up your cross is habit forming. Listen, I know you're right about that thing. Every argument, every disagreement you get in, you can be right and still got to take up your cross. I'm learning this every day. It's not about being right, it's about being righteous. I don't want to win no arguments. Where you going to go with that? So denying yourself is habit forming. The more you do it, the more regularly you do it, the more routine and habitual it becomes. Because there's a point that we are trying to get to is that when you want to say yes, you say no. When you want to say no, you say yes. Because you in the word so much, the Bible says, receive you the engrafted word of God, which is able to save your soul. So if you in the word, then you know God's way. If you in the word, you know God's will. And hear me now, I want to encourage you. Over time, your soul will start to diminish. And I know it sounds cute to say, I should, but I won't. That sounds cute because it's sort of kind of putting people on notice. It's like a warning. I should, but I won't. That's still the soul. I would, but I'm not. Watch this. I even want to, but I'm not. But when you get your soul under control, you flip that thing and say, I shouldn't call her, but I will. Y'all caught that revelation? I shouldn't even speak to him, but I'm going to. What he did to me, I shouldn't forgive him, but I'm about to. We're trying to flip the soul thing because we don't want the soul in control. The soul says, nah, look at her looking at you. And no, she owe you money. I'm still going to speak to her. That's the merest most, gentlemen. That's the merest most, ladies. We're trying to grow up. So the person you don't feel like praying for, you pray. You don't even want to pray for yourself, but I will. I say go back and get your cross go back and get your cross and my final thought and I'm out of your way and I mean this because I want people to understand that I'm not signing up for this unpleasant lifestyle whereby you don't get what you want the goal is to get what you want to align with God's will that's the goal otherwise you would never buy a house you would never get married. You would never buy a car. You would never do anything because you're afraid that it's what you want out of your soul. Let me encourage you with this. God said to Jeremiah, I know the plans that I have for you. I know the thoughts that I've been thinking about you. See, you, you know what's to the corner, but I know what's around the corner. You know exactly what you're going to face to the top of the hill, but I know what's on the other side of the hill so let me encourage you with this your dreams your goals your desires your hopes that's not just in the soul God said in his word hear me I have not seen ear has not heard listen neither has it entered into the heart of man the thing that God hath prepared it's already prepared but he said, your eyes haven't seen it. Your ears had not heard about it. It ain't in the heart yet. But I have revealed it to you by your spirit. And if you get in his word and you stay in the spirit, if you pray and ask God to reveal your will to me. Don't tell me God doesn't will for you to be saved. Healed in a nice car, in a nice house. Don't tell me that God doesn't will for you to enjoy the pleasant things of life. So would you do me this favor, church? Go back and get your cross. Go back and get your word for it's able to lead and guide you to the will of God. Come on, all over this building all over this building to celebrate God for the word with the clapping of your hands.
Let's celebrate Jesus for his unfailing. Now, wasn't that an awesome word from God? I pray that God blesses you through this word and that you meet us right here next week at 7 p.m. as we continue to move through this series called The Marismos. But before we go, I want to just pray with you right quick. And would you just close your eyes and repeat after me? Father in heaven, Marismos me. I present my body a living sacrifice for your use. Saints, listen, we believe if you prayed that very simple prayer, you're serious about what God is going to do in and through your life. So again, meet us right here next week at 7 p.m. And listen, if you would like to be a part of what God is doing here at, at Victory Church, you can become a, what we call Victory Nation, an online member. But better yet, you can also meet us right here in the building on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. at 5155 Patriot Parkway. We would love to have you here as one of our special guests. God bless you, and I'll see you next Thursday.